welcome to the Fungosphere webinar series, brought to you by the Sydney Infectious Disease Institute here at the University of Sydney. I'm Associate Professor Justin Beardsley, and it's my pleasure to introduce these talks, our passionate team, and share some of our mission with you. We're dedicated to increasing our understanding of all things fungal, be that human health, animal health, agriculture, ecology, or even the productive and industrial use of fungi. We are seeking to uncover the threats and the promises offered by these remarkable organisms. This webinar series is more than just a series of talks. It's a platform to bring experts in the field together to share their knowledge and hopefully to build new connections. It's a testament to the synergies that exist between researchers here, but also colleagues globally. Through these talks, we share some of the incredible work being done here in the University of Sydney, but also provide a platform for international experts to share their groundbreaking research too. So, whether you're a seasoned researcher, a student, or simply somebody with an interest in the fascinating world of fungi, you'll find something of interest in this webinar series. Together, we're going to explore the threats and the promises of the fungal world. Today, we welcome back David Fallon, a wildlife veterinarian based here at the University of Sydney. He investigates infectious, nutritional, and toxicological diseases that pose key threats to wildlife. In this talk, he introduces the adorable creature, the wombat, but also highlights some important fungal pathogens affecting their health. Let's hear from David. Well, thank you for having me uh, speak today. Uh, I've created a topic which I think would create fear in most people's minds just looking at it. Um, but I think it'll all become obvious why I've, I've used a different terminology in there. The farsup, uh, fossorial, uh, uh, farsupial uh, we're going to talk about today is, is the wombat. And fossorial means that they just basically spend their time digging around in the dirt. Um, so we have three, uh, three species, two genera of wombats in, in Australia. We have the northern hairy-nosed wombat, which is critically endangered, and its current uh, population is in the round approximately 200 animal mark. They have uh, two populations, uh, the, the two uh, locations where, where they um, are only found in these fenced-in enclosures because um, one of the critical uh, key threatening processes to them has been uh, dingoes and hybrid dogs are very good apparently at, at killing them. But I'm sure that land use has also played an important role in their, in their decline. The southern hairy-nosed wombat, which you can see um, its distribution across the coast of the Great Bight um, is also uh, declining, but there's still estimates of an excess or near 100,000 animals left. And then the bare-nosed or common wombat, which we see locally here, um, is still very abundant in, in the places where it's found. And, They've been tracking them in Tasmania and their numbers are actually increasing, but you can see that there's been considerable range contraction that's occurring. And wombats are threatened by a number of different processes, including habitat loss, uh, motor vehicle collisions, sarcoptic mange, and particularly in the, in the bear nosed wombat. And there's been very little work on, on other diseases that, that might be um, impacting them. And wombats probably um, second only to koalas have a really high profile amongst wildlife carers. They're highly sought after um, to be a lot of very educated wildlife carers that take care of these animals. And, and there's quite a demand for veterinary intervention in, in providing care for them and making sure that they survive, survive to release. And they, they spend a lot of time in care a juvenile wombat might spend up to 800 days in care and they need to be close to uh, 18 to 20 kilograms before they're released into the wild to survive and to compete with other wombats. So um, my history with wombats, I come from North America, as you all probably know. And so when I first came here, wombats were a bit foreign to me. And uh, the first time that I was asked to do a post-mortem on a wombat, was uh, back probably around 2008. And I was called on a Sunday by a wildlife carer who said that she had a, a wombat that was uh, circling, that was blind, had um, abnormal uh, behavior. And she was convinced that it was being poisoned by um, um, medication that people were putting out for mange. So 
I, I drove in on a Sunday and uh, you, the animal was dead on arrival. I did a post-mortem on it. Uh, the following week, I, we had a second one. And then about a month later, we had a third from another location. And all of these had something that has absolutely nothing to do with the topic today, other than um, that's where I got first introduced to it. And they had uh, toxoplasma, uh, Gandhi eye infection or toxoplasmosis, which in wombats causes a very specific lesion here in the brain. You can see the decolorized tissue. And, um, and it causes the blindness that we see, um, the dementia and the, um, the circling. Uh, it's, it's the result of um, exposure to spores that are, are produced or oocysts that are produced by cats as a definitive host. And then when they get into these aberrant hosts, they can uh, cause quite a bit of, of disease. In the process of doing the histopathology on, on these, these cases, um, I encountered something that I had not seen before, but others had. And, and that was the presence of these adias spores in the lung, and you can just see them scattered about in here. And these are uh, fungal spores that are not replicating, uh, that grow or enlarge somewhat in, in the wombat lung, and uh, are sometimes, in some of these cases, associated with another lesion, which is this interstitial pneumonia. And uh, at the time, when I first looked at this, I was still a bit ignorant. Uh, we weren't quite sure if the interstitial pneumonia that we were seeing was actually caused by uh, the adias, adias spores, the presence of them, or whether it might be associated with uh, the toxoplasmosa, toxoplasmosis infection. But going back to the literature and other people's experience, um, this adiasporomycosis, as it's been called, was first reported in Tasmania in 1980 in uh, Tasmanian wombats. And you can see that the morphology of these spores is very similar to what we've just showed you. And that, that it, it's also associated with an interstitial pneumonia. Um, subsequently, um, there was a report of um, uh, the same sort of lesions and the same sort of organism in the Southern hairy-nosed wombat. And there was a, an investigation into their poor, um, poor health and uh, overall poor body condition that was reported in the Southern hairy nosed wombat. So they went out and collected a number of these animals, um, which were shot. Uh, they didn't see any gross lung lesions in them, but these adias spores were uh, found in, in both adult animals and in pouch young in an excess of 50% of the animals that they, they examined. Uh, the spherules or the spores were uh, present both within cells and free in the lumen of the, of the alveoli. And uh, they were associated with some mild fibrosis and inflammatory cells. If you look at the histopath that they show in their slide, the lesions are quite a bit more severe than the way they describe them and very similar to, to the first slide that I showed you earlier. They also talked about uh, small granulomas in the lungs of these animals, and that usually they were associated with um, uh, adiospores that appear to have uh, died. And um, they were surrounded by multinucleated giant cells. These are the first investigators um, to have uh, actually grown this organism. And they showed that it grew um, on a, in a, a typical, uh, Sabros dectros auger plate at between 20 and 25 degrees C, but it did not grow um, at, at 30 degrees C. Um, and they didn't appear to have any particular problems um, isolating, isolating the organism. Um, the third report that's in the literature is uh, adiosporomycosis in northern hairy nosed wombats. And there were two cases. Uh, that happened. These were animals that had adjacent territories. The first animal uh, was beat up quite badly by the, the second animal that died later. Um, and the, both these animals, there were real challenges with describing this disease and understanding it for a couple of reasons. But the most important one was uh, 
that they died out in the wilderness, uh, far from the pathology lab, and uh, both bodies had to be um, frozen before they could be transported into uh, Brisbane where the postmortems were done. And so there were a lot of uh, freeze thaw artifacts in the lungs, but you can see, and if you look at this, this section of the lung here, you've got quite an asymmetrical um, appearance to them. And it's most likely this, this was a dependent lung and that the so-called uh, congestion that they saw was more a factor of blood settling in, in that lung lobe um, than, than necessarily uh, edema and hemorrhage like they may have seen. But you can see in this, in this uh, section that there were large numbers of spores, uh, many more than uh, have been described typically in, in the other lung sections. And they did a trichrome stain on this and they were able to show that there was some degree of fibrosis that was occurring in these lungs, pop, quite possibly in reaction uh, to the presence of these adiospores. Uh, the second case, uh, well, so this is a first case still, and, and the, the lung lesions were, were not found in isolation. In fact, uh, this animal had a lot of other problems. He'd been badly uh, mauled by uh, the other wombat, had uh, severe bite wounds that were heavily infested with maggots. Um, this animal, and this is something that we see in wombats all the time, when they're debilitated, they very commonly uh, get... Uh, they're heavily parasitized. And I don't think it's the parasites, at least not the external parasites that cause their debilitation. I think because they're sick, they're more susceptible to them. But this one um, had a heavy flea infestation, again, common in sick wombats. And then um, it had a severe um, a nematode infection of its digestive tract, which in and of itself could have caused it to be debilitated. So, we're not really sure which came first, the chicken or the egg, whether the, uh, the um, fungal infection in the lungs was a primary problem for this animal or was secondary in an immune suppressed animal, or whether it was just along for the ride like we see happens quite commonly in other wombats and was really an incidental finding. Um, they were unable to, to grow it, um, and, but they only tried it at 30 degrees C. Uh, which is not the appropriate temperature to try to grow it. And using pan fungal primers developed by Swirl and, and, and others, um, uh, they were unable to amplify um, the DNA out of this lung, which is a bit strange. The second animal uh, was, uh, was uh, the adjacent hairy nose wombat, the one in the adjacent territory. Uh, by the time they found that it was dead, it was already fairly severely autolytic. It had a lesion that we've not seen in any other animal with, um, with, with this or similar organisms that had an exudative uh, pleuritis and there was a lot of uh, exudative fluid in the thoracic cavity um, and other organisms, probably bacteria, were, were present in that fluid and may have been the primary cause for, for that pleuritis, we don't know. But there were many adiospores in, in the lung and um, in both of these animals, and as well as the um, animals from Tasmania and the southern uh, hairy-nosed wombat, it was believed based on the morphology uh, that, um, that this organism was, was a Mancia parva, which we'll go into what that means in just a minute. So the question is, are these organisms in the lungs of of wombats, Amancia parva. And what, what do we know about Amancia parva? And what do we know about uh, another Amancia that historically has thought to be very, very closely related to Amancia parva, and that's uh, Amancia uh, crescens. Um, we know that Amancia crescens is, uh, uh, grows at, at lower temperatures um, and produces very, very large uh, adiospores in, in the tissues. They can get up to 700 micrometers across. Um, and so based on the morphology of the ones in the wombat lungs, it would appear that, that they were not um, Moncia crescents and were more likely to be Moncia parva, which is typically less than 
500 micrometers across. And you can see in this section right here, look very similar to what we're seeing, um, what's been seen in other animals, very similar to what we were seeing in, in wombats. The problem is that Amasia parva can grow at 30 degrees and higher in, in uh, vitro. And um, so we would have expected to be able to isolate it at higher temperatures. So what do we know about these two uh, organisms? Uh, both have been associated with disease in, in a large number of, of animals across the world. Um, and they cause this granulomatous pneumonia um, in uh, a number of different species. The species that they're commonly found in are rodents, and that's been most described in rodents across North America and Europe. Uh, but it's been found in animals in, in the bulk of the, of the continents, in North America, Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia. And since the uh, 1960s, uh, there's been a lesion that's been thought to be associated with the Monsia crescens in, well, it has been associated with Monsia crescens based on sequencing. In, in New Zealand and brush tail possums. And these uh, brush tail possums uh, are believed to have picked up this organism from stoats that have been introduced into New Zealand um, and that they believe that they have probably uh, were infected with this when they were brought into New Zealand, become established in New Zealand and then has gotten into the introduced brush tail possum. Um, and, in Europe, in addition to rodents, where it's very, very common, um, it's also found commonly in mustelids. And mustelids are um, otters, badgers, weevils, weevils polecats, um, pine mat martins, and, and the stoat. Um, there was a lot of conversation about how uh, abundant it was in badgers. And uh, I received some sections to look at, at from a friend of mine. And it turns out that the lesions that they were associating with um, uh, mossia and badgers are actually um, immature forms of the, of the rat lungworm and the early stages of rat lungworm. So its prevalence in badgers is, is still a bit un, unknown. It has been associated with disease in humans, but um, that's very, very rare. And uh, bottom line for all of these species, pretty much all of these species, except for horses, which, although they do have their nose down to the ground, would be that they are fossorial, which means that they spend their time, some part of their time underground or digging in the ground or in, in relationship to otters and some of these other species of rodents, uh, which are also aquatic, um, aquatic species. So we come back to this again. So it was assumed that it was a Amasia parva, but um, we had these, these differences in, in the characteristics that didn't really match up. And um, then the, those darn gene jockeys got involved and they sorted it all out for us. And uh, Martin and Felix uh, did the first, did a, a study out of Spain where they were looking at um, fungi that they found in uh, fluvial sediments uh, runoff essentially from uh, rivers. And they identified two um, uh, thermally dimorphic fungi uh, in, in Spain. And, and they've been uh, named this um, uh, Amatsia, how do I pronounce it? Amatsia um, Coralloformis and a Montsilolopsis uh, terrestris. And that doesn't seem to be very relevant to this study yet, but I'll bring, bring that in in just a minute. But if you look at their uh, phylogram, what you see is that um, Amasia crescens um, uh, lands into this uh, uh, clade here, and Amasia parva ends up in, into a clade that's more closely related to, to Blastomyces dermatitidis. And so in fact, it turns out that Amasia parvus, parva is, is a very, very distinct species, quite separate from um, Amasia crescens, and is, in fact is a, a Blastomyces. And um, this is some, some more work done by Yang, Jiang, Jiang um, and they found that um, Amasia crescens um, actually uh, forms two separate clades and that there's a North American clade for um, Amasia crescens and a Eurasian clade for 
osteocrescence. And there's been subsequent studies that have shown that, that these different clades produce different um, sized adiospores in, in the animals that they infect. Um, and they also went on to show that, in fact, that a Monsia parva, which now is Blastomyces parvus, is in fact um, um, a member of the Blastomycetes and is not very closely related to a Monsia crescens at, at all. And then the next um, study, the really uh, quite exciting study that's been done fairly recently, is um, by uh, Dancy. And they showed um, that, that different species of these Amancia crescents were more likely to infect um, aquatic uh, mustelids and um, the land, the land living, must more land living mustelids. And then they showed, uh, they got a hold of the scrolls from those two wombats that died up in Queensland, the northern hairy nose wombats. And um, they showed that that in fact, that the uh, fungus infecting those two hairy nosed wombats was, was not an Amantia at all, but more closely related to these Amantia opsis um, uh, species that came out of, um, out of Spain. So, what is how, how does this relate to, to my research? So, that what um, we have been doing and you're continuing to do is to, to first look at, at the um, disease, characterize the disease a little bit better and the organism a little bit better in the bare nosed wombat. So the avian reptile and exotic pet hospital here at Camden uh, regularly gets um, wombats brought into it and often um, has animals brought in that either die in care or have been found dead, dead on the road. And so our first objective was to determine whether we can grow um, this, this organism. And um, then we can use that for whole genome studies and other genetic studies. Uh, we wanted to see how easy it was uh, detected in, in lungs and can it be readily detected by PCR using very traditional techniques, nothing special. And then we wanted to see whether it related to um, whether the organism that we have is the same one that was present in the Northern hairy nosed uh, wombat, uh, whether it was causing there was a cause and effect relationship between infection and um, the microscopic um, pneumonia that we were seeing and whether we felt that there was uh, sufficient um, uh, disease being caused by this fungus that it would have a, a clinical a significance to that animal and whether there was an indication that it could be treated or should be treated while animals are in care prior to release. And then um, just overall, look at the presence of this organism in captive animals versus wild animals. And, and the answer to whether it can be grown is uh, absolutely. And it's, a no, it's very easy. You just take a piece of wombat lung that you've aseptically collected from an animal that's recently died, uh, grind it up in a, uh, smash it up in a Petri dish, uh, take the homogenate, um, Smash, smash it up in PBS, take the homogenate, streak it out on a sabro dextrose auger, and in about uh, four days, this is what you get. Uh, this is almost a pure culture of, of our organism, but you can see that there are a few other fungi that you might find in wombat lungs as, as well. Um, we've genetically characterized it, and we've used, um, we just used traditional uh, DNA extraction methods. We've collected um, uh, DNA from 15 bare nosed wombat lungs. Uh, six, we knew that they were histologically positive. Nine, we didn't know what their infection status was. And we found that 13 out of 15 were, were positive with a single amplification um, PCR using the uh, primers that were, were used for in the original study to look at the um, diversity in, in wild animals. And we've got sequence for both the ITS and the, and the large subunit. We've subsequently collected some other sequence using other set of primers. And all these sequences were identical to the original sequence that came out of the Northern hairy-nosed wombat. So it appears to be uh, exactly the same organism. 
Histologically, our studies, we had 34 cases, uh, uh, 13 that came from the avian reptile exotic pet hospital here in Camden, uh, 12 that were part of the Taronga uh, Zoo or the pathology registry collection at the Taronga Zoo. And 13 of these were bare-nosed wombats, um, six were southern hairy-nosed wombats, and two the species were unknown. Uh, the way we, we examined the lungs was that we looked at 10 fields of our, of our cross-section of the lung under uh, 10x magnification and, and took the total number of spores that we saw over that. And then we graded the pneumonia as diffuse, which would be quite severe and possibly impacting the animal's ability to, to breathe to some extent, uh, and cert, maybe not under normal conditions, but under any stress. Um, uh, focal um, and, and multifocal to coalescing. And then we um, looked at the presence of spores versus the presence of pneumonia and, um, and attempted to see whether there was any statistical correlation. And what we found was that the, what was that the spores were very similar in size to what had been uh, described in, in all the other wombats in, in Australia. Um, we had um, the bulk of the positive animals were, were wild animals. There was one uh, captive animal that had an um, infection, but the origin of that animal wasn't known. So it may have acquired that infection uh, prior to uh, being in captivity, or it might be provided with an enclosure that mimics what happens in the wild and is allowed to do a lot more digging than the other wild wombats that are the other captive wombats that we were able to, to look at. We also found pneumonia in 17 of 35 animals. And um, uh, the majority of the animals with pneumonia had the more severe form of, of the disease. And um, there was a, a strong correlation between the presence of pneumonia and, and fungal spores in both um, the bare-nosed wombats and the southern hairy-nosed wombats that we looked at. And we had three animals that um, had fungal spores, but uh, did not have pneumonia. So um, when we did our statistics, there was a, a, a strong correlation between the presence of spores and, and pneumonia, and uh, animals that had spores were 3.25 times more likely to have pneumonia than, than animals that, that did not. The lesions in these lungs were um, characterized by uh, a marked increase in alveolar macrophages. Um, adiospores were predominantly found in the cytoplasm of, of alveolar macrophages. And there's this image that I have up here shows an alveolar macrophage surrounding a, an adiospore and um, a mild pulmonary edema and very limited fibrosis. So we don't see the chronic sort of changes that were described in that one uh, northern hairy nose wombat in the animals that we've looked at in this study. So um, what were our conclusions? And, and we'll go, jump, uh, go into some discussion here. And anybody can jump in at any time during this. But the amoxicillolopsis um, was detected in the wombat lungs, appears to be present in the environment across the range of all three species. So we know that, that this fungus exists in southern to mid-north Queensland. We know that um, it extends, uh, environmental range extends to the area of the Great Bight and is, is also present and found in, in Tasmania. Um, we think that the majority of wild wombats are um, of southern hairy nose and um, bare nose wombats are, are infected with this organism uh, based on histopathology, but it might be that with culture or PCR, that we find that the prevalence is higher and that histo histopathology may not be as sensitive as, as those other tools to, to find it. Um, and disease rarely occurs in, in zoological collections, most likely because of the nature of the enclosures that they're in, they're not able to dig down into the dirt and create their own burrows the way they would in the wild. Um, so um, it, it clearly is a pathogen. It's clearly causing disease in, in these wombats. 
uh, the severity of the disease is variable. I guess not a, unexpectedly, life is a bell curve and no pathogens always cause the same disease in every animal. There's always a host pathogen environment interaction that, that's at play. Um, it does cause sufficient enough disease that it could impact survivability in wild or released animals. Um, but we don't know why it causes the degree of variability that it does. In some animals, we don't see disease at all. In others, we've got quite severe disease. And then the question becomes, and perhaps this will be up for discussion after I'm finished, is whether um, we should or could treat these animals for this fungus when they're in care. And how would we know if, if treatment was successful? So in most instances, when we treat fungi, they're, they're growing and, um, and our antimicrobials affect a growing, a growing fungus that has active metabolism. Uh, these um, organisms in the lungs are not growing. They probably are metabolically pretty um, inert. And I don't know whether um, trying to treat them uh, would be successful or not. And in humans, there's a quite a bit of debate as to whether to, to treat them or whether treatment does, does any good or, or not as well. Um, but they do. They treat them with amphotericin and itraconazole in people when they have this infection. And they also treat them concurrently with steroids to mitigate the effect of um, inflammation that occurs in the lungs. Um, but, but again, that's a different species. That's actually Amontia crescens that we're talking about and not our um, our species. And then how would we know how bad the disease was before we started treating and how would we know if we got rid of it afterwards? And this would, might be an area where we could start looking at the possibility of doing bronchial alveolar lavages to see if we can detect the organism in them. Seems likely that we could. Um, you can do transbronchial lung biopsies, uh, which might be able to characterize the severity of the um, disease and then uh, subsequently treat them for a month or two. And then prior to release, uh, go back and, and repeat uh, those diagnostics, get some idea of whether the treatment was, was successful or not. So one of the things I was thinking about um, in the last few days prior to this talk is what, how, what's the relationship between this species and, um, uh, as, and the wombat? Uh, clearly, the wombat hasn't coped uh, to deal with it entirely. Um, it doesn't kill them generally, um, but it can. And it can interfere with their uh, uh, ability to breathe, and that can't be a good thing. Uh, so is there a possibility this is an emerging infectious disease? Could it be like um, Amasia crescens in New Zealand that has recently been introduced? I would guess for it to have this wide distribution, um, probably not. It probably has been here for a long time, but we don't know that for sure. Um, it clearly doesn't benefit the wombat, but it must benefit the fungus in some way or another. And so what I was thinking about is maybe um, it benefits the fungus because I think a lot of these uh, spores that we see in the lungs, in these, um, uh, these uh, pulmonary um, uh, macrophages are probably being carried up the respiratory elevator, being swallowed, and then probably pass through the digestive system and, and, and leave the wombat um, in, in its feces. And so it probably is a good way of disseminating the, the fungus around to be in a wombat. Uh, who knows, maybe wombat poo creates a good environment for the fungus to grow once it's outside of the wombat, or uh, maybe when wombats die, the, the nutrients that are released into the soil um, from the dead wombat may also benefit this fungus, I, I don't know. So um, that's my presentation today. I'd be really keen to um, uh, get your opinion on, on the things that I've said and any feedback that you, you think might be helpful for our research or anything of interest that you might just like to talk about. Thank you, David. That was um, extremely interesting. There's a couple of questions that have come up in the chat. Um, I guess you can see those too, right? There's a uh, question uh, from David Guest yeah. Yeah. about the Cox postulates and um, going beyond association. And a question from Tanya 
about um, the how much of the disease is attributable to the organism. So sure. why don't we start with those and have some conversation? All right. Well, um, if if you could write me an animal ethics protocol where I could take live uh, fungus and infect one of these deer cuddly wombats, I guess we could fulfill Cox postulates. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult to to be able to do that, but but it, it's potentially possible. We'd have to get um, joeys that were in care that um, uh, were kept from exposure to this organism. We'd have to have enough animals to to sacrifice at the beginning of the experiment to show the prevalence of disease. We'd have to infect them and then we'd have to kill them. And I don't see me ever doing that and being able to treat wombats again or walk out of my house probably. So I don't think we're gonna be able to do that. We can just speculate. Um, uh, it does look like it, it was the only organism we were able to identify in the lungs. And um, our, our data, which is circumstantial, um, argues that, that it is the cause of the lesions that we see. We have a question from Julie, or Julie's hand is raised. Um, oh, David, I was just wondering to test your um, theory about wombats being a good mode of dispersal of spores. Have you um, actually tried to culture it in the feces? No, we haven't done that yet. And um, it might be a little bit challenging because I suspect there's a lot of fungi in the feces of, of wombats. Uh, but with our PCR, I think we could amplify it um, readily. So that would be one of the next steps that we might try to do. I okay. have uh, feces from about 40 different wombats in the freezer, um, keeping them for some for a rainy day. So that might be a good place to start. Is, is the organism an environmental saprophyte or what, what does it do in the environment? Well, um, all we know is about the other species that have been identified in, in uh, river bottom sediment um, and they were found in the sediment, but nobody's uh, looked at, at this organism in, in the environment. I assume that the wombat burrow being nice and cool uh, would be a good place for it to replicate and to grow. Um, but I don't think anybody really knows what it does. Even the Amatia species that we talked about previously, uh, it's been hard to find them in the, in the environment. But we have these little, uh, as part of our sarcoptic mange research, we have these little uh, wombat cameras that go down into uh, wombat burrows and can collect samples and things and robotic um, devices. So it might be possible that we could collect some soil samples out of a wombat burrow and see if we can grow this organism from that. Uh, one thing I was kind of pondering as you were speaking about the pathophysiology in the wombats is um, how easy is it to get imaging of wombat lungs? I mean, there's some analogous to chronic lung infections in humans that we would monitor by CT scans and serological markers rather than necessarily invasive things like BALs and biopsies. Sure. Yeah, so um, I think I think that that's definitely possible. Um, they're a little bit more challenging to image, um, but with a CT, they it would be a lot easier. So I think I think that would be another way to do that. Um, again, it'd be, you know, if you saw changes in the CT pattern, you saw improvement with treatment, it would be probably still need to have some histopathological or or some other way to confirm. That, that that change was actually as a result of uh, di diminishing amounts of fungus, I think. Uh, how about the, the serology? Is that something that would commonly be done? Like if you can get an IgG sort of level and see how that changes over time? Well, it certainly could be done. Uh, what kind of antigen, how would I do, what kind of antigen preparation would you recommend? I have no idea. <laughs> Just thinking about how we use them clinically. But I mean, there are probably people online who know more about that than me. Would we have to prepare the antigen against the mycelial phase, or would we have to prepare the antigen against the um, uh, the spores? Uh, 
I'm wishing I never mentioned it. I literally have no <laughs> idea. I just order the test and I know um, how we use them. I'm not sure if there's anybody more immunologically minded online. Mark's there. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So um, it's quite fascinating. These I've, Judith Nimmo sent me one of these uh, in 2005 or something from a Victorian wombat. Um, and I think in that one, there was almost no seemingly no host response and you've described in your big series um you know a couple of them having no host response really at all identifiable um so it's really interesting to me that quite a distinct variation in the host response i was just going to follow up on something that you um said that you sort of implied that you didn't think that these fungi were growing in the lung they were sort of just present do you want to elaborate on that yeah, so in, in fact, uh, um, the definition of an adiospore, uh, which is what is, is sort of a really vague term if you want to think about it, because it encompasses the spores from Amoncia crescens, from Amoncia, from the, our now Blastomyces parva or parvum, um, and from a number of other uh, unrelated or in the same group of fungi, but not all that closely related. Uh, they are all believed to um, infect uh, lung tissue and, and, and not replicate. So we don't see any uh, budding uh, like you would see with blasto or histo. Um, they enlarge, the um, Amoncia crescents um, enlarge, 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 and the older the animal is, the bigger the spores are in there, but they, they don't see any replication at all. There's no dissemination from the lungs into any other tissues. And so they're assumed uh, not to, to replicate in the lungs and to be constantly exposed. These animals are constantly exposed. They're probably, I really think in these wombats, they're, they're getting rid of them um, as they go along, but we, we don't see any replicative forms histo histologically. And I didn't, I didn't reference your uh, case. Uh, <laughs> it was... <laughs> Yeah. I found it though. I don't know how you would have found it. <laughs> David, do we know if there's, I'm oh, sorry, um, David guessed. Do, I just yeah. asked a quick one and then David guessed next. Um, do we know if there, is there any replication within the macrophages and similar to what you'd see with Cryptococcus? I mean, no. I see that inside there, but. There's, there's no evidence of that at all. Sorry about the dog. <laughs> okay, David, guess, guess. So, so David, what you're saying is that the <clears throat> the wombat picks up the spores from the soil, presumably. They go into the lung, but then there's no replication. So there's no there's no contagion. There's no wombat to wombat um, infection, and and so in that way, is it, this is something I'm trying to grapple with for a lecture I'm giving next week about. Epidemic epidemiology, and in plants we distinguish linear epidemics and, and exponential epidemics. Right, so linear epidemics are um, when a plant gets infected, but it doesn't spread from that plant to other plants. That plant dies, and and the inoculum stays in the soil. So when another plant comes along, it gets infected. So you get a linear epidemic rather than you know your typical exponential epidemic. I, I'm, I'm asking because I'm grappling for an example of a, a linear epidemic um, from, from the animal kingdom. Well, this would be a good example, I think. Um, and it's, uh, if you go back and I can send you or I can um, direct you to a, a good um, paper on, on the studies that have been done on this. Uh, but um, the bottom line is, is that we think it's just an environmental exposure. We think that's what happens in humans as well that the organism doesn't replicate in them, that they get the dose from being wherever they are and inhaling the dust and that it grows in them and it may, it, no, I'm sorry, it doesn't grow in them. They may distribute it, they may help disseminate it, but they don't, they don't amplify it. I think in general, fungal infections are not spreadable. Uh, um, the, the, it's a dead end host. This is my, my understanding for most um, fung fungal infections. Well, it's certainly true for aspergillus in birds. I mean, they, it, 
it kills them and they don't, uh, if you have an infection in one bird, you don't, it doesn't transmit it to another bird. We may see multiple Aspergillus infections in an aviary, but the reason for that is the environment. And we've got an environment where there's lots and lots of spores and where, um, where there's poor ventilation and infection occurs as, as a result of that. So um, yeah, Aspergillus is very, very common uh, issue in uh, birds that, uh, well, really common in, in birds that aren't, uh, that are Arctic birds, Antarctic species, ocean species, that don't encounter these spores very often. And then when you bring them into wildlife care centers um, on land in a humid environment, then they, they die from it if you don't treat them to prevent it. Thanks for that. Great examples. Uh, Mark, I think Veland had his hand up first. Oh, no, Mike, it's fine. Go ahead. I can ask <laughs> the next one. <laughs> I, I was just going to ask because it's a weird situation, isn't it, where we've got a fungus that um, doesn't seem to replicate in the tissue, yet we've got an association with disease. And I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm trying to grapple with that too, because I'm just thinking, you know, are these animals, um, uh, presumably the spores from the mycelial phase are different. I actually don't know. Um, and are the animals um, um, exposed to lots of those um, spores from the mycelial phase, is that where they're getting, because I can't imagine that we wouldn't see other fungi if it was just present in the soil and, and they're inhaling soil. And I, I can't imagine that we wouldn't see other sort of evidence of pneumoconiosis or whatever associated with it. It's a, it's a, it's a fascinating interaction, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think there's a couple of points there. First of all, if, if you go back, and I'm a little bit ignorant on this, but I think I think if you look at the original uh, paper where they grew it in in the um, southern hairy-nosed wombats, out of the southern hairy-nosed wombats, when you increase the temperature of the uh, fungi, the level that, that, that they're no longer compatible with them growing, they start to form these, um, these spores. So um, I think that the, the mycelial fungi produce these spores that then get disseminated into the environment. The other thing that nobody's really talked about is the size of the spore versus its distribution in the lung and, and everything else. And these guys, spores may enlarge somewhat when they're in the, uh, in the wombat, but the typical size that we see, the smallest size we see is about five microns, which my understanding is about the right size for them to be able to penetrate the respiratory system down into the, um, into the alveoli. And so I think it's, it's much a factor of the size of the spore perhaps as anything else. So why it's able to get down into the lungs and why other fungi may not be able to. So do you think there are mats of these mycelia growing in these burrows? They're growing somewhere, yep. Yeah. Well, I, I had the same kind of kind of uh, problem to understand if we have just an organism which is inhaled and stays and does nothing. So how does the disease uh, occur? Is it just a reaction towards the spores from the, the body to say there's an allergic reaction or something? Because normally I think you would see multiplication and 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 a dissemination and and causing disease somewhere else or on making like a lesion in the lung, which then causes like the stopping of the working, uh, working of the lungs. So I think for me, it's kind of hard to see if we only assume that the spores is present and does nothing, then how we, we associate the disease with the with this presence of the spores? That's a good question. And I don't have a, a, an answer that I can base in science other than uh, what if these pulmonary macrophages that ingest these spores uh, die? Mm -hmm. And then, then, then they can the inflammation can be associated with uh, necrosis, um, um, associated with the immune response trying to get rid of them, um, and that's uh, that's the only thing that I can think of. It can also be an allergic component, similar yeah. to the ABPA and SAFs kind of picture. Yeah, it sounds sounds like an allergic disease, like asthma or um, hay fever, something like that. You get the fungal sensitization from aspergillus is um, 
course, lung disease as well. As Platysporiums and penicillin, you know, all, all sorts of fungi, yeah. So it might be if that was the case, what we might see is as the animal aged that the, the lesions would get more severe. If we looked at the disease in joeys, the very early, you know, their first exposure, there might be fairly limited inflammation, but in older animals, there would be more. Is that how fast does that sensitization uh, develop in in people? Yeah, in people, it's normally following a significant exposure, and then re repeated small exposures can be triggering for asthma or for a chronic inflammatory lung condition. Um, I suppose one thing that would be different is they'd respond to steroid therapy rather than getting worse. Mm. So it's not antifungal therapy, but anti-inflammatory therapy that is effective. In humans, the uh, uh, Adria spiromycosis caused by different organisms is um, in some, uh, it's associated and it occurs in, in healthy people. Um, and then in others, and there's an emerging uh, disease that's occurring now in uh, South Africa. It's predominantly associated with uh, AIDS-like uh, disease, but at least that one in South Africa, I think the organism is actually replicating in, in, the, in the lungs. So that would be different different situation. It's really interesting. The other, the other thing that strikes me as a really nice um, experiment to run with this organism is um, to look at its interaction with some sort of macrophage model, because, um, you know, that, I mean, it looks like it's got a big cell wall and, you know, lots of defences, I suppose, but that, that might be part of the, part of that. And uh, so I think the temperature thing, I like that, that, you know, it gets to a, a body temperature where it, it can't actually physically um, um, proliferate, but but um, that interaction with the, the host macrophage is also sort of an interesting line of investigation for this lung. Yeah, I mean, you probably could purify those spores from a lung and put them into tissue culture with a macrophage, some sort of system. Or collect them from your mycelia when you grow it. Yeah, that's true. Heat them up. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed today's talk from the Fungus Fair webinar series, and we look forward to seeing you next time.